So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's April 11th, 4-11, uh, 2012. And we are doing the first of what we're planning to be three shows, at least. It can go further than that if we'd like. Um, my name is Paul Allison from New York City. Um, and um, I don't usually introduce myself. I'm glad I did that. Time. Anyway, <laughs> we have a, a wonderful uh, set of guests tonight to come talk about <laughs> NetSmart, Thriving Online, um, a new book by um, Howard R R Rheingold. He's also made available a syllabus, a uh, high school level syllabus that we might be able to talk about. So what we wanted to do tonight was just kind of kick off the conversation. Um, and then Howard's going to join us on May 2nd. And then we're going to have one more show in between there to talk about the rest of the book. But we thought we'd talk about the introduction or anything that kind of hits you. Let's um, start with introductions. Um, and I'll model that by saying that I'm a high school teacher in the Bronx. Um, at uh, Bronx Academy Senior High. Alice, why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Alice Barr. I'm the Instructional Technology Integrator at Yarmouth High School in Yarmouth, Maine. Great. And a fellow EdTech Talk Yes, one-third of the seedlings. <laughs> Welcome. Chris. Thanks. I think it goes alphabetically, by the way. We figured okay. that out at one point. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Sloan. I teach English and Media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. Monica. I'm Monica, and I'm in Colorado. Um, just trying to shake things up a bit. <laughs> cool. Nancy. Oh, I do go next. OK. Hi, I'm Nancy <laughs> Sheroff. I'm a second grade teacher in New York, which is in the Hudson Valley, and I also teach graduate courses online. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Raleigh, and I'm the technology director for a small pre-K through 8 uh, private school in northern New Jersey. Cool. Scott, welcome. Hi. I'm Scott Hello. Lockman. I'm Scott. Oh, I'm Scott. based in Tokyo, Japan, and I teach a variety of adjunct-type courses from ESL offerings to uh, computers and public speaking. And I'm just finishing up a class called Cyberspace and Society. And I've been thinking about using Howard's book for the next semester and reading through the introduction. I find it quite exciting. So, hello, everybody. Hey, Welcome, Paul, Scott. I need to interrupt. Um, Go ahead. The, it says the people in the chat room say this has gone black on their screens, and the audio right before that was cutting in and out. So, sorry yeah. to interrupt the introduction. We're doing the best we can. I, I told them that. Yeah, not much I can do about it. Okay. It'll have, it, yep, thank you. Cool. Scott, tell us your handle and uh, your podcast and so forth so we can be reminded oh, okay. of that. <laughs> I, I, well, I never <laughs> pass up a chance to self-promote. Good. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Scott Lowe, S-C-O-T-T-L-O, and my blog is uh, scottlow.com. And I'm not currently podcasting, but I've got a couple of uh, things in the fire that I'm thinking about and working on. And I'm also involved in the DS-106 project that I imagine some of you might have heard of and DS-106 radio. So my blog points to some of that stuff. How's that? We, great. Wish I had your pipes, man. Those, those are... Yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking the same thing. <laughs> can't help it. Va Valerie, welcome. Hi, hi. Valerie Burton from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm a high school English teacher. And Vinny. Uh, my name is Vinny Vratney. I am a high school academic integrator. Um, I also am one third of the 21st century learning team on edtechtalk.com. <laughs> Welcome. All right. So NetSmart and the introduction mainly. Um, Anybody? So, I think Howard poses this as a really, really important thing that we are at a point in our culture where we really need to 
be thoughtful, be mindful, um, really be careful about how we're using the media that um, is out in front of us. And that we have a chance to kind of direct it in positive ways. And if we don't, nefarious things might happen. Um, so do you see it that way? Do you, do you buy his, uh, <laughs> His couching the issue in in that kind of in those kinds of terms, and or anything else you want to kind of start off with here. I thought I'd throw one question out, but let you guys add your own questions and, and thoughts. Who wants to jump in on that? I'll jump in. Good. Um, Sarah Raleigh. Um, and the thing I I realized I forgot to say in my introduction is that I also teach computers to kindergarten, first and second graders, and the reason I mention that is this. We do a lot of education related to um, being online um, actively and, um, you know, internet safety and using your smarts. And what we found was we were focusing on our middle school and that by the time our kids got to middle school, they were pretty set in the way they were doing things. And not that we stopped working with them, but we said, we've got to move this even earlier. We've got to look at when do our kids start interacting with each other, collaborating, cooperating, and as, um, as it, the introduction mentions, having negative things happen too. And you know, we, we started to look at when do we start with those things. And a lot of our focus is on being a good citizen. We used to talk about <coughs> digital citizenship, and now we said, you know what? It's really just about being a good citizen. It doesn't matter where you are. The thing that the introduction really made me think about was mm -hmm. giving attention to attention. Because I don't think that's something that, that I've really been with groups that have talked about. And so for me, that was fascinating to say, yeah, we're talking about the information literacy piece and, and what he terms as crap detection um, and collaborating and cooperating, but we really don't focus on attention. And I feel like I have to be much more mindful because I feel overwhelmed, yet I'm talking to children and other adults about how do you handle all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Folks, keep in mind if you're typing, you might find a way to, to mute, that would be good. Um, so attention, what is that? Can somebody describe that from his book? Or what you're taking from it? Oh, I'll, I'll jump in because it's one of the things that we uh, actually took. Uh, we just came off of spring break and have had the opportunity to once again meet with our high school students and as the fact that we're seven weeks away from finals, um, I found that the focus on attention in the introduction, and then, you know, I know that you want to focus on that, but and then in the first chapter, which is all about being mindful and defining what your goals and what, what you're trying to accomplish online so that, therefore, that you can be purposeful in terms of your use of the technologies and not get caught up and lose time but really focus in on the task at hand that you're trying to accomplish. Um, I'm really thankful that he started off with attention as opposed to the normal information literacy pieces around social media and about crap detention, detection and all the other aspects of it. Because I think that, you know, especially for students, multitasking or attention switching as, as he properly lays out in the introduction is something that students really need to become more thoughtful, purposeful, and aware of as they begin to work online and with all the other various different communications media. Yeah, I had my students um, read, uh, at the beginning of the year I had my seniors read Is Google Making Us Stupid, that uh, Atlantic article, and uh, they were all pretty sure that they could do both. Uh, you know, he uses the metaphor of, you know, I used to be a, a scuba diver, but now I just jet ski, was kind of Carr's metaphor. And my kids were like, you know what, we like to scuba dive and we like to jet ski. So we feel like we're pretty good at doing both. 
But, you know, after reading the mindfulness part, you know, that chapter one that Vinny was talking about and, and the stuff about it in the introduction, you know, I'm not so sure because even me, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> that uh, I'm completely mindful as I'm clicking along through things because there are those times when, you know, I'm, I'm interested in something and it takes me down a path right. which is very different than uh, where I thought I was going to go, which, you know, there's a good thing about serendipity, but there's also this this idea of mindfulness that uh, I think even though we think we've got it down, uh, that metacognition is is so important, I think, for all of us. Well, he, he brought up a, a, I was reading ahead, I just started reading um, yesterday actually and just got sucked into the book. It's absolutely wonderful. And just for the introduction, because that seems to be what we were focusing on tonight, um, there were two phrases that really struck me. And the first was learning to live mindfully in cyber culture. Um, I can see how we can teach that at the high school level and perhaps introduce that at the middle school level, but I'm very much concerned, as is Sarah, how do we bring this down to the elementary level? Because we're starting to need to teach our, our students um, at a younger and younger age in terms of their online presence and, and how to do research online, etc. And the other phrase that struck me was the how to exert mental control over our use of the always on communication channels. And that's something that I personally have been struggling with for the last couple of months. I've taken some, you know, power off days, um, which is difficult because I thoroughly enjoy being connected. But I'd like to go back to the learning to live mindfully in cyber culture. How can we look to address that in the younger grades? If I can jump in, I how to parent and not every child is, is needing that and also to set boundaries uh, so that therefore that they can this, the students and their children can be more mindful of how they're utilizing and accessing the technologies. And one point that was interesting because I, I was reading ahead and he was discussing how students are looking at their parents and seeing that they are constantly connected and they're not powering down and focusing on them. So I'm wondering if, you know, we need to somehow teach the parents as well about how to, you know, monitor their always on life. There's that that brings up something that I was concerned about. Um, when I was listening to Vinny, I was thinking about a piece of what Nancy just said, and that is the online offline being connected stepping away and how do we balance that and for me sometimes a piece of that has to do with courtesy and respect and i think in some ways it's an extension of the things that we teach little kids anyway i mean i was in mm -hmm. class today with second graders and spent a lot of time getting their attention and reminding them that I'm not going to speak when they're speaking because I know that in five minutes they'll ask me what to do and that there are many of them and two adults in the classroom, you know, their regular classroom teacher and myself, and that, you know, trying to help them understand that if they listen to the directions, they may need a little bit of help, but if they need a lot of help, everybody else is waiting for help. Um, and in the introduction, um, there's a description of an exchange with the author's daughter where they go out to dinner and she's checking all her email on her phone and I 
I know that I find when I'm talking to people and they pull out their phone, I usually stop talking because I don't believe that people can read and listen at the same time. Um, and I, I had a conversation, it's a little aside to this, but it has to do with the way I think about this. Um, I had a conversation with someone because I'll go to a meeting, like a staff meeting, and I'll take out my knitting. And some people are taken aback by that. But the learning, one of our learning specialists said to me, but that's not a language-based activity. A different part of your brain makes your fingers work when you're creating something that has nothing to do with language. So you can listen and you can have a conversation and you can do something that's tactile. But I think the multitasking of language oriented things is difficult, if not impossible. And I think we may have to start with our kids at different ages talking about scenarios. You know, how do you feel when your parents have their phone out? And therefore, how do you think I feel if you pull your phone out, you know? And that may be a piece of it is sort of making it real to them. What do you experience that you like or don't like in your regular environment? So I remember, go ahead. I remember, the, I remember the exchange too from the book about the dinner and it, it reminded me of last week. I didn't tune in last week because my daughter made me turn my phone off. <laughs> so my nine-year-old is, I'm answering emails. It must have been maybe 7.30 or so. I'm tweeting, I'm Facebooking, I'm answering emails. And she wanted me to study vocabulary or watch television or whatever it is. So I unplugged my phone and I, I don't do that. And I made sure that she understood I'm turning it off because I'm going to spend time with you. You're more important right now than this is. So mommy's unplugging. But I also let her know that as I put her in the bed, mommy's now about to plug back in now. You know, we've, we've had our me time. Mommy still, I still have work to do, but you know, we spent the last two or three hours together. We played, you know, and I made sure she understood that I appreciate the fact that she felt lonely. She wasn't being attended to. So I shut it down and I attended to her. And that's just something as parents, I guess we really need to be mindful that the kids feel that they're important, that they're not being neglected because of the Blackberry or the iPhone or whatever, you know? But I think it also helps model that there's a time to be connected and a time not to be connected and I think that you're show, you know you're modeling that behavior and hopefully that'll you know continue with her as well but a lot of parents don't mm -hmm. so we need to we need to look at that and so how how can we address that how can we model that for our students I mean obviously as a teacher in a classroom we're not connected during that time or hopefully not <laughs> I'll speak for well, myself uh, well, uh, ca can we flip it a little bit and think about how could we be connected in mindful ways in the classroom? Because I, I don't think it's just about turning it off. I think it's about um, using it thoughtfully. I mean, one of the one of the quotes that I wanted to pull out of here um, is about it says. He's, he talks about thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it instead of just going through the motions. And, and some of the things that Monica has been um, teaching us, if I could say it that way, um, through the detox process and, and so forth, is, is that moment of reflection and looking at what we are doing and trying to shut off all the voices, I guess, and really follow what you want to do and why you're doing it. Um, Monica, do you want to say that? I mean, I certainly found echoes in the introduction and the, the stuff about attention to that work. Yeah, um, a slightly different take and good, because maybe the balance, um, for one, um, going back to the family, I talk to my kids 
in sometimes much richer ways and sometimes um, more often than I would normally um, through texting, um, my son in particular. So there's, there's a balance there. I really liked what Sarah said at the beginning about um, talking about being good citizens. And as I think that the more we blur the line between on and off and connected and not connected, that's the healthiest thing to do for kids or for all of us. You know, that um, if we're good citizens, then, then we notice that we shouldn't be talking to someone right now. But the fact that they see we're connected to all these people is really important, especially, you know, if you're in a classroom situation. Um, I think that's a huge element they need to see and see modeled. How do you connect to other people? The piece um, that about the mindfulness, um, mm -hmm. if I don't, I think it's in the book. But Howard talks about um, the first day of class and how he has everyone turn everything off, and they're assuming that he's going to give them the big lecture about, you know, not in my class, you don't. But what he's, his point is that. Um, our mind is wired to go a gazillion different places. And so the curiosity within us is the thing that helps focus us. And so if we do set people in free spaces where we get to follow that curiosity, that's what that's where the real focus comes in. You know, so it, it's you know, just a, a balancing out that um, looking at looking at all the ways that um, we can go either side or say it's it's an and, and we're just gyrating back and forth, you know. I don't know if that really addressed it. Well, I, I don't know what, I do know a little bit about mindfulness. I've gone to a couple of workshops, you know, it's related to Buddhism. It's, you know, so it's not just about turning your, your, your machines off. It's about, it's about a, a focus. It's about a discipline of some sort. So I wanted to honor that in, in the book in some way. Well, I think, um, uh, I, I think, Paul, it's you that's, that made a comment about awareness and the fact that it's not, you know, um, is, are you turning off your devices or not, even though that's a very important piece. And you asked the question of, about modeling for kids at appropriate connectedness. And mm -hmm. I, I think there are a lot of tools that make a lot of sense in classrooms. Um, my technology and I teacher and I always talk about what's the appropriate tool for whatever you're doing. And of course, we want our students to collaborate so, um, and cooperate and, and work in groups and have a chance to explore things that they're excited about. And so I think the question is, do we have environments where we're allowed to use those tools and we're allowed to model for our kids what makes sense and that decision-making process because I think that's part of attention and mindfulness and, um, and, and making good decisions. And it's how we instill in our kids, um, you know, uh, those, those um, strategies for long-term usage. What's the word he uses? It's architecture of participation I think and I just got lost on that great And so it does help them focus more if, if we allow them to have those moments of those restorative niches during the day. I mean, they go through a long day where we're constantly telling them how to think. And we're, in a sense, making them less mindful because we're telling them what to do, you know. Paul, go ahead. I just kind of jumped in while you were at all. Oh, thank you. It's fine. I, I'm fine. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, it, it's architecture of participation. And my book is over here, that's why and you don't hear me when I turn to it. Uh, at any rate. Um, shall we move to other topics um, that come up in the book? Uh, Scott, you've been waiting to say something, I think, or Alice, do you have anything on your mind about the beginning of this book? So I want to invite you guys in. I don't know that I have anything to say. I've just been enjoying hearing the topics that have come up and the idea. It's so powerful, the, uh, the example we do set for children, and they see mommy and daddy focused on the machine, and then the machine becomes a more important reality than the child. That must be how the kid takes it, and I've not thought about it so concretely until just hearing the, the people mention that, that. That is so important, and then how do we, we model the, the proper behavior and the message that that sends. So I, I thank you for sparking my thinking with that. One thing that jumped out at me on this, this idea was another question that um, Howard asked, and that is, what should I be doing now? And also, where is my body when my mind is racing through this cyberspace and making these connections and following these trails? What's my actual meat body doing? And that perhaps this is part of that mindfulness or that detachment that we do need to remember that we have a, uh, we have. We're really pulling up to The, the right way to use things and so if we're not modeling that at school and not modeling that at home I don't you know I I think I think that's where the the key is to really um, appropriate use I guess is the best way to say it one of the things I've tried doing with my current class which is just ending cyberspace and society this is undergraduates at Temple University Japan so 60% of the students are American and the rest are Japanese of varying levels of English. But I'm really trying to sell them on the idea in 10 or 15 years from now, so much of your life will be conducted online. There will be this information economy. And also, how will education change at that time? And I asked them to look at the recent video that Brian Alexander did called The Visible College with four views of the future. He did that at University of Mary Washington and there is the ideas of augmented layers of reality which we presented physical schools will be diminished resources won't come to them so how will this online experience be in 10 or 20 years and I got a lot of resistance from these college-age students saying that I don't really look forward to that that I'm for me going to university the most important part is socializing and making friends and connecting and that if we try to get younger students into it sooner, let them develop this literacy, that's going to come at the expense of learning to interact, learning to play, and learning to socialize. And I must say, I was really kind of shocked with that sort of pushback from the university students. And I think it's a, it's a valid objection, and I guess I'm encouraged that they're thinking in, in those terms. It kind of reminds me of um, his definition of literacy now, how that's changed. And that, uh, you know, he says that it's not, it now means the skill plus the social competency, competency in using that skill collaboratively. And, um, you know, to me that, that struck a chord because um, my students are all pretty, because I teach mostly seniors, they're all pretty literate by, you know, our traditional standards. But are they, um, you know, literate in the way that Howard's talking about? Um, you know, not as many as I would think. Um, you know, I think that a lot of them are good at, uh, you know, let's say posting something, um, whether it's video or photo or, you know, text, but when it comes to collaborative work and um, that kind of thing, I, I don't think as many of them are literate by that definition. 
I actually had a conversation today with a colleague who um, is our in, our librarian, and we were talking about how kids are seem less likely to be deep learners um, these days. That um, and some of that is, a, I think, a literacy skill from from the sense of um, the people who are. For example, research, a research paper, if you will, um, the skills of doing research, who, who, the people that are teaching it are as non-literate as the people who are doing the research. And so how do we, like, how do we help kids become, really see relevance and meaning in their learning and do deep learning on a certain topic, for example. And I think Howard's kind of trying to get to that with this whole aspect of these are new literacies or relatively new literacies. And we're all, what's interesting is we're all kind of at the same level in this, that historically teachers have been the quote knowledge keepers if you will and we used to we used to have people teach us how to research but for some reason <clears throat> research has become this thing that teachers make assumptions that kids can do on their own because, because technology is involved I think I Alice I think you're absolutely right I, I think there's a um, a misconception by a lot of educators about what students um, know related to technology. Um, and I try to say people that you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're digital native or not. I tell teachers, you know, you may not know how to use all the programs, but you still know what you've always taught your kids about thinking and learning. And a lot of people make assumptions that the kids, because they can jump on Google and type in a term, that that means they're effective searchers. When in fact, if we've never talked to them about how to evaluate what they're looking at, they're not very efficient. You know, they may use information that's not good, that they're not being critical about it. Um, and I think that speaks in some ways to the deep learning. You know, um, and, and my question, and it's sort of general to schools, is who takes the lead on it? You know, when I have a third grade teacher that I worked with, because last year I taught third grade computers also, come to me and say, you know, could you spend a period with my class on searching? Because I know you're good at it, and we're not getting it in the library. Then I think to myself, because in my school, library is really not part of my department as technology, even though there's a lot of overlap. But I still think to myself, I have to do something about this. Because someone has to pave the path so that we help our teachers get to a point where they also understand what's involved. And so that when they're supporting their students, they don't make the assumption that just because they're comfortable with technology, that they're literate about how to use it. All right, I, I want to argue a little bit of, with that, though. Right? Okay. And and here's here's the deal. So, what makes you a good searcher? Anybody can answer that. Um, what do you think is the basic skill in searching that you need that our kids don't have? Well, I don't think they know how to necessarily uh, read. They can put in a search term, but are they asking the right question? And do they know how to look at the results? Uh -huh. But in addition, I would say that depending on the age of the student, they don't necessarily know how to put a good search term in. We used to have a librarian who sat down with kindergartners and searched for images. And I thought it was a great precursor because what she would say to the kids is, put in the name of the animal you want to look for and the word animal. Because if you didn't put the word animal, you got all the sports paraphernalia. 
And sometimes you got negative things. And just by adding one word, which our little kids wouldn't know, they totally narrowed the search and were much more effective. And kids, they don't know this out of nowhere. I, I want to push back on this search thing for a minute. May I? Is it okay? Andrea, um, go for it. Zelda. Hi, Andrea. Hi, everybody. Did you late, introduce sorry. yourself? Go ahead. I'm Andrea Zellner, um, and I'm late. But <laughs> and I want to talk about search. <laughs> go ahead. So, um, right. So searching is important. Narrowing the search is important. At the same time that we're teaching our kindergartners to narrow, Google is getting even more intuitive about what we're searching for. And mm -hmm. the fact is that you don't need Boolean operators anymore, all that stuff that I learned as a kid about search. Some of it is, in fact, about asking the right, right question. And sometimes I wonder if the skills aren't merely in the digital world. It's, we've always had the problem of asking and getting the right answer to our questions. So it might be in a geometrical proof. It might be um, in evaluating sources is a similar skill to evaluating the um, narrator in a text and how, how believable that narrator is in a piece of fiction. Um, all of these things can cross those lines, and I think what we need to do better with um, technology is making those things visible. So when I'm over here talking about um, the true story of the three little pigs and about whether we believe the wolf or the pigs, that is a really great way to segue into the reliability of sources in our search. Um, so, I, and I also think that the, the other thing that Howard Rheingold's bringing up too is that we have also unprecedented access to expertise. So one of the reasons that Google's in trouble right now is that I frequently go onto Twitter and ask my <laughs> tweets <laughs> a question that really okay. should be Googled because I'm lazy. And I just trust that my people will use their brains in a way that's more efficient than me searching through my Google. So, you know, really it's m most efficient to go to the book I know has a picture of the animal I want in it. And maybe that's the right thing that I should be doing as a kindergartner as opposed to looking at Google. And so I think broadly, my, as my whole thesis here is that I would say making those specific skills visible um, to our students about what is going to overlap and the way that things are going because we can't naturally anticipate that things are going to stay the same. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in. Sorry. Uh, a couple of things. Hang up. Andrea, that idea of outsourcing it to your, your tweet people or your right. tweets, does that make you a good searcher or a bad searcher? Do you get a search badge for that, or do you lose your badge if you outsource it? <laughs> I think that's a great technique. But that, if I may, just one more thing, and this goes out to the point that Sarah mentioned, and Paul, I'm glad that you picked up on that, because when she said the other third grade, or the third grade teacher said to her, Sarah, you teach them search because you're a good searcher. I, I chuckled when that was first said, but I'm glad you brought it up, Paul. But what is this saying about the third grade teacher she identifies herself as not a good searcher and I perhaps we don't have the answer to that but that would be interesting to know why she feels a lack of confidence in her search skills and mm -hmm. to learn to think in the same ways that they always have. Totally agree. 
but I find it fascinating. And I think some of this is confidence and comfort that I, uh, a couple months ago, did an afternoon after school on searching. And, you know, it is true that Google has made it so much easier. But you know what? If you don't pay attention to what changes and you're not listening to your online colleagues that are involved in tech who are saying, hey, did you notice this new thing that Google threw out there? You're probably not looking for it either. And I had a fifth grade teacher who uses technology. She is an older woman. She probably could retire if she wanted to. Um, but uses it, you know, so I'm not saying she's not a user, but when I talked about the left-hand sidebar in the Google search and how you could narrow down your search, so even if you don't use a lot of search terms, you can go in and say, well, I just want news or I just want this or that. And literally half an hour in, she says, you know, I just found two things I was looking for last week and I spent a lot of the week looking and couldn't find them. So. You know, there is a certain level of skill, and there's a lot of us who will figure it out on our own, but there's also a lot of people who won't. I think about that a lot in terms of people who don't figure it out on their own. And I think it goes, sometimes I wonder about this. Um, I heard Chris and I both heard this person, Chris Sloan and I. I can't remember her name, Chris, but she came and talked to us that first summer we were together. And she talked about getting a computer in like 1972 or something. And her principal said, I don't know what you really do with this, but we have it for your classroom. And she said, well, um, you know, can we do whatever we want? And he said, yeah. And she said, can we break it? And I thought that was like the best question ever <laughs> I could think of. And I think that there's a certain, you know, I joke around with teachers when I'm working with Google and in search and all these different functions. Like, it's really okay if you break it and it's okay if you don't do it perfectly. Because I sometimes think there's an unwillingness to play. And the play sometimes develops the habit of mind to intuit the way these different uh, services go. I mean, because if you think about social networks alone, there's different nuances of the network between Google+, Facebook, Twitter, internal Nings, or other social network sites, blogs. I mean, you can really go on all day. But each network divide, de you know, develops its own nuances about the way that people interact with one another. And so all of that can't be anticipated. There's no one skill you can teach. And so it's almost I don't know how you get to those habits of mind where I'm just going to press whatever button. <laughs> I have to be okay. <laughs> you well, know? I think that the younger kids are, the more willing they are to press the button. And we somehow take that out of them. Um, and I think that's a really good point. I mean, it takes it back to our classrooms. And when our classrooms are um, teacher handing over information, teacher talking about exactly how to do everything, we stop our kids from figuring things out. And I think we do have to have times where teachers say, you know, uh, this is the time for you to do X, but X is not 10 steps. It's just X. And you, you have to be willing to say to kids, try it. Figure it out. Um, we took our second graders into Minecraft this year, just mm -hmm. three sessions, one to actually two to kind of just figure out how do you move around in a virtual world, how do you chat with each other, talk about what's appropriate. Um, and the th third one, I said, you know what, I really want these kids to build what's reasonable. And I, and I said to them, I would like you to make your initials out of blocks. I didn't tell them whether they should lay them out on the ground or whether they should build them up. I, I didn't want to give that kind of directions. And there were some kids who, after they tried a long time, I really did have to say to them, you know what, once you've built three blocks high, you have to actually get on a block like a ladder to put the next block on. But some kids could figure that out by themselves. And then you get the second grader who literally said to me this day, how do I log in? Okay, you have to understand the username and password are saved. All she had to do was click the button. Yet, a half an hour later, she raises her hand, and she has inlaid her initials in the ground. I didn't tell her to do that. She just did it. I don't think we give our kids 
enough opportunities that are just open-ended. Some places more than others, of course, but I mean, it is happening places, but I think our kids need more and more, and that's how they're going to become adults who press the button just to see what happens. So I wanted to um, ask if I, if I could summarize from the last five minutes or so there that sometimes searching isn't the problem. Like somebody says to you, you can you teach my kids to search, but the problem might be they need to play more. They need to learn how to ask questions better. They need to be more confident in what they know already. Um, you know, and those are those are non-digital skills. Um, if I could say that, I and and I think mindfulness is also something that we don't teach in schools. In fact, we might teach not teach mindfulness. We might teach the opposite of mindfulness a, a lot. So, expecting our kids to be mindful in cyberspace is a big jump if we're not already teaching that. You know, so, and then I want to ask a question, which, I mean, I, I kind of, that's you push back and whatever you're thinking about that. But if you looked at Howard's um, s syllabus, it's, it's intense and yeah. pretty directive mm -hmm. and <laughs> it's like, wow, <laughs> um, pretty prescriptive if I could even say that. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. And if, a, if somebody went into that material by choice, I think that would be amazing. I just, so, and this is connected to what I've been thinking about. I'm just wondering, do we need to teach this stuff separate from content? It feels like, it feels like another discipline. And I wonder if we need another discipline. And Scott, you teach that discipline. So <laughs> can you address that? Do you hear my question in that? I, I think I do. I don't know if I'm up to the task yeah, of we'll getting it back. as well as I might. Um, I'm thinking of what well, one of my students uh, came up with this semester. And this, this kid, uh, he's not a kid, he's in his mid-20s. He, seven years ago, decided that he wanted to learn how to program computers, and he taught himself. And so he didn't need the class in terms of what we were looking at. And he wrote a very persuasive paper at the end that, you know, learning how to become fluent in this social networking space is, yeah, it's useful, but it's not the most important thing. What we should be teaching students to do is how to program, learn how to use these machines to do purposeful things. And this might be getting off the topic a bit, but that was the, his student's, opinion. Comment, the oh. student's comment came to us reading what Rheingold is preparing is this sort of roadmap for digital literacy in the social networking space. And that seems to be just sort of defining this media scape that we'll be participating in. And perhaps that's maybe looking backwards, that this is the climate we have right now, but obviously it's going to change in ways we can anticipate and imagine. And I love that at the end of the introduction, he referred to uh, Alan Kay. And the first line of his book said um, something about don't predict the future, invent the future. And I think that's the idea that my student was presenting and saying we ought to teach the young people how to program the machines rather than just use them to uh, grab information and, and communicate. That's kind of what I have. Hmm. Thanks, when, I look, Others, yeah. when I looked at the beginning of the syllabus, and I say that because he maps out ongoing assignments. Right. And I think I had the same sort of thinking that, that fuels Paul's question, which is, couldn't these things be applied to any subject? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that teachers should necessarily apply all of them, yet I do wonder, um, should be, they be picking some of them? You know, do you choose, and, I, and I'm just scrolling down the, the syllabus right now, you know, do you choose to have lexicon teams that right. pull out keywords or key questions, <laughs> mind map things, take notes in class that get shared. Um, you know, we, we often contend with kids who can't do all these things. So give them one. 
and have other kids that do another thing and everything gets shared we have the technology for that and everybody walks away with all the pieces and it doesn't matter what the subject is so the syllabus could be like a map that a group of teachers could look at together and divvy up and say yeah let's try this part and you try that part that's a nice suggestion i like that and paul you made me think of another thing um Recently, I was talking to my brother who also teaches, um, and I forget what the original topic of our conversation was, but he told me about a school where he taught where there was sort of a secondary curriculum in place. His example to me was about kids learning to give presentations. He said, everybody knows in the school at what grade levels kids are expected to do certain things related to giving presentations. So that when they get to high school and they get graded on stand-up presentations, they've had a lot of experience. And it's not, um, it's not mm -hmm. by the luck of the draw that they got the teacher that does presentations. It's because the school created this curriculum on top of every subject area curriculum that covers those things. And when you talked about teaching mindfulness, I thought, we have some things we do like that. I think most places do that with character education to some extent. But I think there are a lot of things we could use to have layered on top and have everybody cover in some way, and we don't. Hmm. Other thoughts? We're in the last five or 10 minutes here, so jump in, folks, with your thoughts. You know, Sarah, I just want to say it's so interesting and validating to hear you talk about um, a way for kids to know about presentation skills, for example. We actually are talking about that very thing in our high school right now. How do we teach kids the skills of collaboration and presentation skills and all those things that are behind the scenes, but are so necessary for everyday functioning in, in a job, in school, whatever. Um, and I think those things have kind of gotten shuffled under the rug because of all the things we have to teach. And sometimes they're under that funky term of 21st century skills, but I don't really think they they are. I think they're just skills that kids need to have now. And, and I love that idea of starting really young and moving all the way up. Thanks for validating that for me. But Thank it's you. so great. Have you guys followed um, Sukhata Mitra's travels with um, Nod of head, if you have. I don't want to reiterate no. the story. Okay, so um, Go ahead. his experimenting um, is going into villages and um, putting in a laptop hole in the wall is, is mm. what it started out being called. Yep. Um, and he just had a talk in Hong Kong, I think, um, not too long ago, and was watching that. And I think that the secret is that he he leaves the computers, leaves the kids with the resources, and he, he deliberately doesn't teach. So a lot of things come into my mind. Um, Eric McWilliams has this incredible paper called, um, that talks about the skill that we need is to be usefully ignorant. And then the conversations that we've had so far about um, teachers not wanting to search or whatever because they don't know how. Well. We need to model that more. We need to model being usefully ignorant more. I mean, if we go in with a slick presentation, they're not going to know what to do when, when something bad comes up because we never, never something bad never came up for us. They don't know the simple thing of pushing the back arrow and then just going on, you know. So I think there's a lot to be said about, for one, letting them just play with stuff, but also us modeling playing with the stuff, you know. We are expert learners I, you know um, so learning is messy and now I'm thinking of Dave Cormier um, whose most recent presentation on rhizomatic learning says the one thing we need to do is to prepare people for 
um, to embrace uncertainty. And how? How do you embrace uncertainty? What you... I didn't feel like you were done. <laughs> um, <laughs> you embrace, to me, you embrace uncertainty by um, taking each moment as it is. And so, so now back to the very beginning of tonight, Howard's mm -hmm. talk about attention. To me, um, all these things, if, if I know beforehand what I'm, my curiosity is, you know, I'm all those things coming at me online or in person, because to me it's all the same thing. I'm swimming in this life, and that, those are just different aspects. Um, the uncertainty is where that's going to lead me, but my, my inner core of what I want to find kind of drives me through that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you, you get really comfortable with failing and saying, oops, that's, that's really cool. What am I going to learn from that? You know, very Carol Dweckian at that point. It's, it's a different mindset, I think. And I think mm -hmm. it's really important that we model that for our students when, it, uh, let's see, Andrea was talking about searching. Um, I think rather, like you mentioned, rather than coming to the presentation, going step by step, showing students and teachers how to do a search, how to do an efficient search, I think it would be so much more powerful, and I know it is because I've done where you are actually making mistakes because you learn from those mistakes. And I teach a second grade student and we have a whole responsive classroom climate. So from the very beginning, I taught them that I will on occasion and sometimes very frequently turn to them and tell them, you have a problem, solve it. And I don't think we give our, our students enough credit sometimes. I think we're, we're too quick to try to help them find the answers when I think they would glean so much more if they find the answers on their own if, and if they just have teachers who believe in them and believe that they can do it. And I tell them, I said, listen, when I tell you these things, it's because I truly in my heart believe you, whatever problem it is, it can be something as minor as, I don't have a pencil to, I can't, you know, I, I don't know what to do on this program. I said, if there's ever a point where I think you need the assistance, I'll be the first to, to jump in and help you. And what I found over time and what parents have come back and told me is that my students are now telling this to each other. So if somebody comes up to them and, and says, well, you know, I don't know, that, that person may turn to them and says, well, I think you have a problem, you can solve it. And parents have stopped me and said, you know, my child is now telling me or telling their siblings this phrase. And I think that if we allow them, I don't so much allow them to play more, but I think if we allow them to fail more in a safe environment, that more learning will take place. My two cents. Helpful. I had a two cent comment just as an example, um, if you have other thoughts. Crap detection. Um, there's there's almost an apology in the syllabus that says maybe you don't want to use the word crap in high school. Okay. I, I'm okay using the word crap in high school. Maybe you're not. <laughs> but but I have a bigger objection. I don't think the problem is accuracy. I think the problem is is it a, is it enough of the story? In other words. I think all of that stuff about uh, reliability of online sources is missing the point of my experience with kids. Um, because, because of Google searches being, being so much better than they used to be, what's on top of on Google is usually pretty reliable, frankly. Um, and, you know, um, but what's, what's not clear is what part of the story are you not hearing? Like, so it's not about what's accurate. It's like what's left out, and I think that's a more subtle, more, more, more useful thing to be dealing with with kids. So I just wanted to put that out there as we continue reading the book, thinking about complicating that issue. 
Sorry to do that at the end, but who else wants to complicate a add a good question here at the end? <laughs> That's a pretty huge two cents there, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry Thanks. about that. But Scott, what what are your questions as you enter? Why do you want to maybe use this book? I said that at the beginning. Um because I don't have a textbook and I've I've just scrambled to pull materials together and it's been frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I've this past semester, I've just revisited old trails and ideas, and actually Howard Rheingold uh, was with me when I embarked into the internet about 25 years ago with his virtual communities, and just mm -hmm. rediscovering them over the last six months has been uh, very rewarding. So that's kind of why I would like to use it. But just and I love his I personal we're... stories in here about all the all that yeah. time. But by, by the way, because yeah. because it's. They're personal stories, but they just happen. So it reminds us of how fast all this is happening. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we're over time now, so I'll, I'll, I'll save it yeah. for the next meeting. But okay. thank you all. This has been absolutely wonderful and great. Good. Um, sparks. We're going to talk about the book again in, in two weeks. Next week, okay. um, and uh, Sarah, thanks. I think it was Sarah. Thanks for mentioning Minecraft. We're going to be in Minecraft with um, Chad Sansing and... Um, Joel Mowley. Um, and so more about Minecraft next week, but then we'll return to the book on the 25th, if I have that right, and then um, Howard's going to join us on the 2nd, if we don't offend him too badly here. I don't think we're <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Vinny, you have any final thoughts? <laughs> no, not at this point, thanks. I've enjoyed the conversation. Well, let me rephrase it. Yes, I have lots of final thoughts, but not enough in a short amount of time. So g jump into the book, Let's, and we'll get back together in a couple of weeks. Anybody else want to jump in here at the end? I won't go around and identify everybody again. But... Shakehead, no, we're good. Well, I, uh, okay. that I, think, I yeah. think Howard is a perfect model of hmm. Carol Dweckian person, and he's learning and continues to learn how to embrace uncertainty. So I don't think we can offend him. I think he I, he loves yeah. he loves hearing more joke, yeah. about everything. He's he's a he's a five year old spirit, which is what I think the goal should be. Great. Um so wanna finish up here. Sorry about all the dropping out and everything, but I'll talk to Time Warner about that or something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I um, want to say that we've been broadcasting here on the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. And thanks to Dave Cormier, who got mentioned earlier. We'll have to get him on here to uh, have you and Mo have him and Monica talk about this and more. At any rate, <laughs> um, and uh, Jeff Lebo. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. Have or whenever evening. we see you again. Yeah, good night. Nice. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Sarah. Bye.